everybody. This is Chris. And Kathy. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to our show through your favorite streaming app. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. Check out our ever-growing list of affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Proceeds from purchases help to support our show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Chris. How are you today? I'm doing well. I am, I am so excited to introduce my new friend. I'm actually going to call Jennifer Green my new friend. I, I think you should. I think she would agree. <laughs> yes. We were introduced, actually, by another friend and fan, Kelly Minson of Heads Up Pets Water Collars. My understanding is that Jennifer Green and Kelly were at a trade show. And they connected, and Kelly says, you're really going to hit it off with Jennifer Green. She has so much great information that I think your listeners could benefit from. And I'm like, do tell. And so Jennifer Green is is a rep with a company called Pet King Brands, but she's going to talk to us today about ears and allergies. And I understand this is a very common couple in the veterinary world and veterinary medicine and elaborating on why we as pet parents and maybe the veterinary community may just be scratching the surface when it comes to those itchy ears. Get it? Mm -hmm. Get it? (laughs) So we are going to take a deep dive into ears and allergies today with Jennifer Green. And I know that they also, the company has a, a number of products, but I actually use their their mouth product called Oratine with my Cavaliers um, as a substitute for brushing at, at times. And Kathy, I think you use the ear product, if I remember correctly, so we could talk about that a little bit later. Kathy, you'd mentioned that, that ear and, and mouth problems, you know, in your experience as a veterinary technician are, are often overlooked by owners. Yes, I did say that. And I think that it's not overlooked intentionally. I think that if your dog is running outside and they scream and they come up lame, you're like, oh my God, and you rush them to the vet. But sometimes I think ear and mouth pain maybe isn't so obvious. And maybe you're you're picking up signs, but you don't understand that that actually is a painful thing. And ear stuff can be very painful. Definitely. And, I, and I'm looking forward to to again, educating our audience on, you know, what signs to look for and um, how it, how it can be addressed. So at this point, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Jennifer Green. She is a certified veterinary technician with over 10 years of clinical experience in small animal and an additional 11 years in the animal health industry as a veterinary sales rep. And throughout Jennifer's career, she has become all too familiar with the struggles and discomfort that pets dealing with allergies face. Her technical and professional experience has provided her insight on how to recognize and give recommendations on managing allergic conditions affecting the ears and skin in both dogs and cats. Now, she enjoys helping both veterinarians and pet parents to find ways to improve the health of their pets by informing them on safe and effective allergy relief methods. And lastly, when Jennifer is not working, which it seems like she's working all the time, she enjoys chilling with her rescue doggers, Edwina and Trixie. So Jennifer Green, welcome to Petability. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you all so very much for having me. It is a pleasure to meet you both, and I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to to get into it. So Tell us what we need to know about itchy ears. It is a such a a common presenting problem seen in in many, many veterinary practices. Uh, Otitis externa, also known as the infection of the outer ear, is very, very common in dogs as well as cats, but not nearly as prevalent in cats. I've become all too familiar with 
the struggles and the frustrations and discomfort associated with it. So many dogs I saw when I was a technician in practice and then also working on the other side of the counter in sales, talking with pet owners, with, with veterinarians. It is a constant thing and how to, how to manage them, how to prevent them. There are so many products out there. There are so many misnomers and a, a lot of people just, it just takes a lot of educating. Many pet parents just do not know which signs to look for. They don't realize that pet, that their dogs or even cats are capable or it's possible for them to get an ear infection. They don't know how severe and painful it can be. And then they're kind of left wondering, well, how, how do I treat this? How, what's, do I need to go to the vet? Can I do this at home, over the counter? So it's very broad and there's a lot of information. You can Google for days on it and get a lot of different opinions on it. So uh, it is, it's a, a subject that I talk about every day in my job. So it's certainly something that I am very, very familiar with. This was definitely one of the top five, if not one of the top reasons why we saw dogs in practice. In fact, over 75% of those cases that we saw with ear infections, allergies were the culprit. So, and then that gets into another, another topic of the, the, the coupling of allergies and ears. Itchy ears, ear infections. My day as a veterinary technician was full <laughs> of, of painful itchy ears. So I would agree. I think this is a very common thing and a common reoccurrence that we see with a lot of animals too. It's going to be more prevalent in those ear, the dogs that have the long floppy ears, mm -hmm. um, your, your, your hounds, your, your cockers, so that the air is not getting into the ears, but it can certainly be in, in, in all breeds. So I know, Jennifer, when we talked um, prior to this interview, you shared a very poignant story about something that happened early in your career. And I think that maybe our audience could could benefit from hearing the story because it speaks to the seriousness that ear conditions can cause and how frustrating and potentially tough to manage uh, it can be. Do you mind sharing that story? I've not been out of technician school very long. The first practice I worked in, and I mean, we uh, we were seeing problems with the ears on a daily basis. And the there's always tough situations as a technician. You you deal with euthanasia and abuse cases and cases that people aren't financially, you know, able to to take care of certain things. And I mean it runs the gamut. There's it's very rewarding, but it's also heart wrenching. One of the the specific cases that has stuck with me and I think of this this dog every day, and it's kind of what fuels me to to do the very best that I can at educating people on ear infections. And I saw a two year old golden retriever that had to be euthanized due to chronic ear infections. They had tried every every product out there. They'd even done an ear ablation and tried everything, and the dog was they never got any success. So I think about his name is Riley two-year-old golden and I, I see his sweet little face. It is something that that is very serious and it's what drives me to make sure that no one ever gets in that position and has to get to that point where they have to make that decision. I don't want any dog or cat to ever have to suffer like that or any pet parent to have to get to that point and make that decision. So can we go into letting the audience know what what the signs are of potential ear infection, because I think some of them might be might be subtle. Sometimes maybe we have a little bit of hair loss around that ear, and maybe that's just a subtle symptom, but I know there are others. Can we talk about what to look for? They can be very subtle. The causes of ear infections, which I'll just kind of touch on that, a lot of people don't realize that over 75% of, of cases, like I've mentioned, are going to be due to allergies and allergies can be environmental allergies. They can be a contact allergy, parasites like ear mites or fleas or a foreign body, but or they it can just be debris and water and, and earwax buildup that's down in the ear, heat, and then it, it turns into an infection. But a lot of people don't realize, especially if they've never had a pet before 
and never experienced that. It can start very small. They can take a paw and just just sort of rub at the ear. The ear might sort of flick a little bit. They may start rubbing it along the carpet. You can certainly see hair loss or alopecia. Might be some redness around it. There might be an odor coming from it. Animals, especially cats, groom themselves a lot. Dogs are always licking their paws, you know, rubbing on things. So you might miss mistaken it for that they're just just doing it to do it. But certainly when you when you start to see these subtle signs, uh, just flip the ear up, smell it. Does it have any type of a, of a yeasty odor? Is there any discharge coming from it? Any any redness? So those are certainly just the very, very subtle signs to look for. So Jennifer, um, one thing you yes. mentioned is, is lifting, you know, the ear and visually examining it for redness, discharge, wax buildup. And then you mentioned about odor. And is it my understanding then that a dog's ear should have no odor? And if there is an odor, that that could be a sign that there's something going on? Definitely. There should not be an odor, an odor to, to your dog's ear. When I say there should not be an odor, sometimes dogs or even cats can just have wax buildup or just a dirty ear. And there may be a slight odor, but it, the, the severity of the odor is what is a sign. Typically, it's going to smell yeasty. And by that, it's going to smell, for lack of a better description, like a, a sweaty sock, basically. Uh, it's just going to have a, a, a very, a very sour odor to it. And you'll also have, have discharge. There'll be, uh, you'll see the redness, inflammation, and there may even be some purulent discharge, some yellowish or even a dark brown or uh, blackish discharge. But you know, typically when you have a, a healthy ear, it's going to be pink and it's not going to have any type of discharge and it's not, it's not going to have any, any odor present. And you mentioned earlier too that ear problems may be more prevalent in the dogs with the flap ear, floppy ears, as opposed to the pricked or pointy ears. You know, I was looking this up. I was shocked to know that there are actually 12 defined ear types for the internet. I would just wow. think about <laughs> floppy and pointy. But I guess what I'm trying to ask is why are the floppy ear dogs more prone to problems? What happens there? Yes. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah, the, the breeds that have those, the floppy ears, your cockers, your poodles, your, your hounds, your sheep dogs, versus dogs that have the ears that are up and correct, or even cats. What's going on there is air is not able to get into the ear canal. So when you have ears that hang down, it's going to close off that ear canal. So it provides a warm, moist, dark environment. And that is a perfect breeding ground for bacteria and fungus and yeast. Dogs that like to swim, which unfortunately are, can be the floppy ear ones, your labs that love to swim, water will get down in the ear and then some debris and it sits down in there and the bacteria and fungus and yeast will, will multiply. So those that's why it's it's more prevalent in those floppy ear dogs versus the ones where the ears are going to be up and pricked. Lock, lack of oxygen just closes off the air and allows for that gunk to to multiply and breed and uh, and create a perfect environment for an infection. How do we diagnose ear infections or or allergy or allergens in this. So what when we go to the doctor, what are they going to do to let it to determine whether this is an ear infection? Well, the, as far as the, the diagnosing, when they the pet owner, if you're they're picking up on those signs we discussed, you certainly want to take your your dog uh, to the veterinarian to have it to have it looked at. Uh, the veterinarian will use an otoscope and look in the ear. Uh, they typically will do what's called a cytology where they will take a sample out of the ear, look at it under a microscope and be able to see what type of microbe are we dealing with? Is it bacteria, is it yeast, or is it fungus? Yeast is probably the, at the top of the culprits that's going to cause a, an ear infection. And that's what you're gonna smell, that yeasty smell. That is going to be an, an otoscopic examination, cytology, and then the culture. And then they will, will get that back and let the pet parent know which type of, of microbe they're dealing with. And then they will, uh, the next step will be which treatment they want to go with. Microbes is kind of the umbrella term. And then you said like yeast, bacteria, 
and maybe just debris. I don't know what other options there are, but those fall under that umbrella of microbes. And so identifying the microbe is really important because that will lead to what treatment is selected, what's going to be best at addressing that ear issue. Based on whether it's bacteria, fungus, or yeast, that is going to help the veterinarian determine which treatment. Most ear infections are going to be a mix. They may be more yeast than others, but typically you're not going to see just one microbe, harmful microbe. It's going to be a mix of bacteria, fungus, and, and yeast. So based on those factors, a veterinarian will determine how to go about treating this condition, whether it's, is this an acute, meaning it came on very quickly? Is this chronic, something that's been there for a long time? That also uh, needs to be factored in, in terms of you know, mm -hmm. how, uh, how the course of treatment, how, which, which medication is going to be best, which can be used long-term, and how long, how long to use it. And if this is going to be something that can be, it's just a one-time thing, or is this, in some cases, this has been, like in the case of that golden, there are some dogs that this is going to be, unfortunately, something that they're going to be dealing with on and off for, for life. They're just, they're prone to getting those infections back. If you can knock them out, but there are, then you're going to have to get on some type of regimen where you want to prevent it. You want to maintain and prevent those infections from returning. And there are certainly options out there for that. We talked about allergies being a, you know, a root cause of these ear infections. And so I'm interested about the causes of these allergies. Are they, you think they're largely environmental or is there a component to ear infections that might be related to food allergies? So are those the two type of things that you might see as a common root cause for? Sure, absolutely. I mean, general canine and feline allergies. Uh, I mean, basically, to if I can go back to, just to, to break it down, what is an allergy? An allergy is defined as an abnormal reaction of the body's immune system to any substance that they often, you know, incite as a similar reaction to other individuals. Pets can develop allergies the same way that, that, that humans do. The body mounts a particular type of immune attack against a trigger. Unfortunately, the effects of allergic reactions are far from harmless. We went through the symptoms, but the, the general allergens in both dogs and cats are going to be fleas, uh, dust mites, mold, it can be pollen, uh, it can come from food, grooming products they can have an allergic reaction to, cleaners, it can be their bedding, it can be litter, it can be a, a household cleaner. Uh, and also, it can also come with age. The same way that as, as we age, our immune system becomes more susceptible to developing allergies. You know, with, in humans, we sneeze. Dogs and cats are going to itch. And those allergy receptors in humans are in the respiratory system. Our, you know, our eyes itch or in water. We sneeze. In dogs and cats, their allergy receptors are on their ears and on the skin. So as they age, and we can have, I have Edwina, one of my doctors, did not develop allergies until she was nine and then develop allergies to freshly cut grass. So they, and as they age, they will, will begin to develop allergies. Yeah. Jennifer, I think that's an important um, point to make. I grew up in Iowa. I ran around like a banshee. I mean, I rolled in the weeds and I climbed trees and I cut grass and all of that. Never experienced any sort of allergy. As an adult, if I am even near any sort of poison ivy, I get a histamine response. This summer, I had to go to the hospital to urgent care and get an injection and be put on steroids because my body could no longer get rid of it on its own. It has escalated over time and I've become more and more sensitized. And, you know, you're talking about the respiratory effects with people, but you know, for me, that allergic reaction was itching, right? To poison mm -hmm. ivy. I mean, you can't sleep. You know, I'm I'm itching my skin to the point that it's bleeding. It is distracting. I it's hard to work. It's hard to even socially carry on a conversation when I mean it was all over my body. It was horrible. I always say, you know, put put yourself in your dog's shoes if you can, you know, if you've had any sort of like experience, then you know, 
you're better equipped to know what they are experiencing, what they're going through. Certainly. I mean, the, the n- number one symptom associated with allergies in dogs is going to be itchy skin. And you know, sometimes that, that itching is going to be limited to certain parts of the body. It might just be the face. They might chew their feet the way that Edwina does. But in more severe cases, I mean, almost no patch of skin is unaffected. And a lot of times these allergies can be seasonal. But I feel like anymore, it doesn't matter what part of the country you live in. Cold weather doesn't stop it. Dogs are itching year round. And at first, you know, it, it's going to become worse when the weather warms and plants start to pollinate. But then, then it might improve in the fall or winter. Then over time, many pets with allergies develop year round symptoms. And that unfortunately is what I am see- I've seen more and more of is there is no downtime for allergies. Uh, my dog is allergic to grass. That's what, that's what Ed- Edwina is allergic to. <laughs> allergic to grass. And one of the things we noticed, of course, is that he was itching, but it was causing him so much frustration. He would itch and then bark at himself. Like he would turn oh around. And I know it was so frustrating. Um, and it's such a frustrating thing to manage. So I, I think I feel for the owners and I understand, you know, what it's like. And nothing's worse than seeing your dog be uncomfortable like that, you know, and itching and no. scratching like that all the time. We have it under control. And we're, he's doing really well right now. And again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of the Zymox the odic uh, enzyme enzymatic solution and it's also really helpful for my dog and in, in getting out that debris in his ears and thankfully he's comfortable <laughs> well that that is wonderful to hear i know i worked when i was a technician i also worked at an emergency clinic on the weekends for about a year and you know some people when i'm at a vet show do many vet shows talking to veterinarians and veterinary technicians even pet parents some people don't consider an ear infection or allergies to be an emergency but I cannot tell you, I did graveyard shift, and I cannot tell you that two, three o'clock in the morning, people banging on the door with a dog that had, you know, when you're, they're scratching and clawing at their ears or they're chewing their skin and they're crying and they're, they're uncomfortable. It is definitely an emergency and they want to do everything they can to, to give them relief. And they, they, they try, you know, you can give Benadryl you know, over the counter, that doesn't always take care of it, depending on the severity of it. But you're talking about allergies of the skin. You look for that red, irritated skin. Uh, Kathy, like you said, barking you know, at themselves, just obsessive licking, itching, hair loss, you r- rubbing along along the carpet. You feel very helpless seeing your pet in, in so much discomfort, and you, you want to do whatever you can, but a lot of people just don't know what, what to do. They don't know where where to turn. So Jennifer, you know, we talked about how overwhelming allergies are and, you know, we chose to focus on the ears because you said you're known in the industry as the ear chick, which yes. I is <laughs> awesome. I meant to say that in your introduction, you know, we're introducing yes. the ear chick, Jennifer Green, but typically do, do skin and ear allergies go hand in hand? They absolutely do. They okay. absolutely do. Because going back to what I said uh, about the, the allergy receptors on, on dogs are found on the, the pinna, the, the back of the ears, and along the skin. So okay. and many people kind of feel like that they're separate, like the, the skin on the body and the ears are separate, but they're really not. You know, the skin that goes, it's on the inside and the outside of the ear, it, that's where the allergy receptors are as well. And then it, even if you don't, more prevalent in those floppy ear dogs because of that environment uh, that's dark and warm set up for bacteria, fungus, and yeast. But what can happen is allergies on the skin can turn into an ear infection is because those allergy receptors are found on the ears and on the skin. The dogs will start to, to scratch at the, at the outside of the ear, the inside of the ear, start rubbing it, gets it irritated. And then those allergies, that inflammation will travel down into the ear. And with that inflammation, then you get the, the, the swelling, the inflammation, and then that will set up the uh, perfect environment for bacteria and fungus and yeast to, uh, to start to grow. I recently okay. learned from a veterinarian friend of mine that white dogs seem to get more allergies in general. And that was news to me, you know, and then I think about like a Westie, for example. And so they're prick eared but yet they're white. And so that, I liked your explanation of how, you know, like if their skin's irritated, maybe there's a genetic linkage between the color white and prevalence of 
or susceptibility to allergies, and then how that can turn into an ear infection. Certainly, and you know, the so yeah, it, it complicates things because the the shape or the form of that pinna, the outside of the ear, the ear canal, can also predispose dogs to developing you know, the otitis externa or or ear infections. So I, I absolutely, and then identifying these factors is what's key to successful control of this inflammation. Mm -hmm. So, but there's just there's there's you know all these factors. There's again, it's such a broad a broad uh, subject to talk about all those factors, you know, whether it's parasites, foreign objects, allergies, but allergies being the one that we're talking about. So many people don't, don't realize that. So it's just, you know, going back to the way that the ear is actually formed or actually mm -hmm. shaped. And then the ear canal itself, which is typically L-shaped. So that, in, but it can be, the ear canal can be more, more narrow on some dogs. So allergens and irritants are going to become trapped down deep and then the air is not going to be able to get to it. And that's, again, that can be another, another cause for the ear infection. Jennifer, should we be cleaning our dog's ears daily then? And then to follow up on that, can we talk a little bit about the antimicrobial enzymes and the addition of using that as well for for um, ear treatment or ear cleaning? Ear cleaning is an essential part of, 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 of any therapeutic um, regimen that you're going to be doing with to maintain proper ear, ear health, whether it's done as a uh, home flushing alone or following a flushing. Sometimes they do in a clinic setting under anesthetic. Uh, sometimes if the, the ear, when presented to the, to the veterinarian, if it's stenotic means it's completely swollen shut or it, it has a, a tremendous amount of gunk of organic matter of exudative pus they may want to put the animal under a, a light an anesthesia and then actually do an ear flush where they run an, an endoscope down into the ear and flush all that gunk out to rule out is there a polyp is there a growth is there a foreign body, there are ragweed, there's all types of little things floating in the air that can get trapped down in the ear and sit there and cause that buildup. Is it, so is there a ruptured uh, eardrum? So it's, it's a lot of veterinarians will like to put the animal under light, light anesthetic, do a flush, run it, like I said, or endoscope into the ear to rule out is there what, what's going on in the ear. It's not necessary to do a daily ear cleaning. There are a lot of ear cleaners on the market that you can get over the counter that your veterinarian may prescribe. It really just depends, and I don't mean to be vague about this, but it really is a case-by-case -case situation. Those dogs that are prone to getting ear infections, those ones that are unfortunately going to be dealing with this for, for life, may need a daily ear cleaning that can be done at home. It's not something that it ne that needs to be done just for everyone who, who has a dog on, on a daily basis, because in doing that, you can disrupt the pH of the ear. Mm. You can over, some products can be over drying and then that can be irritating and then get the, the dog itching the ear and that can open up all, all sorts of things. So unless the dog is showing signs, unless the dog has been has been diagnosed with an ear infection, you know they have ear problems, you know they're they're prone to getting ear infections. I would not, and many veterinarians would not recommend every day to put put a cleanser down, down into the ear. Uh, typically after the the dog has been treated for an ear infection, it's really good to get to a to find a good product that's a good fit that you can use. And it might be once a week, a couple of times a month that you just squeeze it down into the ear just to, uh, but it needs to be a product that's going to, to keep that pH neutral in the ear. That's never going to be over drying, but one that's going to be safe. That's not going to have any, contain any irritants, anything harmful or harsh, anything that's going to have long-term side effects, but something that's going to keep that ear uh, fresh and clean without over drying and without altering the pH of, of the ear. And then you you definitely have to be proactive about it. You have to 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 check the ear daily and you know, smell the ear, look at the ear, make sure that there's not any discharge, there's not any redness, they're not you know, flicking the ear, shaking their head. Allergies are not, it's not a one and you're done thing. You you right. can treat 
and then you you think you're on a really good maintenance prevent, preventive program, but then they get older or they can develop an allergy to something that you think things can always change. Mm -hmm. So you just, the most important thing is for pet parents to just always be, be checking, always be, you know, as you're, you're petting them, you're bathing them, you're, they're laying their head in your lap, just flip that ear, ear flap up, check it, smell it, make sure that there's, there's nothing going on. Sometimes I leave the ear flap up just to get a little air in there. You know, if he's sitting on my lap, I'll just flip him over. Oh, I, 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 absolutely. I just absolutely. Like yeah, it just lets some air get in there. Yeah. Jennifer, you had talked about the importance of getting a product for the ears that will cause no harm to the surrounding tissues or the tissues of the ear. And I think that that leads perfectly into uh, having you talk a little bit about the antimicrobial enzymes. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what it does and how to use it? Certainly. Thank you so much for asking me that. Yeah, antimicrobial enzymes have, there are broad spectrum antimicrobial enzyme uh, therapy that is that is available that has been around for for centuries uh, milk proteins specifically have a broad spectrum antimicrobial component to them and will kill bacteria fungus and yeast antimicrobial uh, has enzymes have many advantages over antibiotics I will never say anything negative about antibiotics. Antibiotics have their place. They certainly do great things. However, they like with they can in people. I have kidney stones. I have been on antibiotics my whole life. There's not an antibiotic that I'm not resistant to. And the same thing will happen in animals. Uh, antibiotics will do a great job, but they long term not really a, a good choice because they do they do have side effects. So and with antimicrobial enzymes, and by antimicrobial meaning they're going to uh, effectively get rid of bacteria, fungus, and yeast, whether it's in the ear, whether it's on the skin. And, but they're gentle because they don't have memory, meaning there's no antibiotic resistance. So you don't have to worry about that. They can be used long-term because they don't have any effect on the internal organs. Uh, there are unfortunately some antibiotics that will, and I know this from personal use, can have an effect on your on your kidneys or your liver because that's, and this is systemic, meaning when you take them internally, they you can have a, an effect on your on your liver and kidneys over time. So with antimicrobial enzymes, especially when used as a topical, whether it's inside the ear or on the skin, you're never going to have to worry about any long-term effects. Uh, on the on the the body, you can use antimicrobial enzymes on any any species of, of any age. There, there's no concern with that. No concern for for toxicity. So Jennifer, you mentioned that you know this is broad spectrum, and and that means that it covers a lot of things. Like you said, it 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 targets all the possible things in terms of the the microbes, so the bacteria, yeast, and fungus. That's what broad Correct. spectrum means. Okay. Right. Yes, 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 absolutely. And in the in the the case of an ear infection, it's typically going to be mixed, and then you can also have a, a mix of those those harmful microbes. There, there, there's good bacteria and there's there's bad bacteria, just like it is in people. And certainly, the when I say the the microbes, those harmful microbes, it's bacteria, fungus, and yeast that will be in the in the ear as well as the skin as well. But yeah, that's what you, what I mean when I'm saying I'm anti, antimicrobial. And you, you were talking about antibiotic use, um, and I think you're going to elaborate a little bit more, but the long-term effects you said can cause organ damage through, you know, when you're ingesting that orally. But also, again, I know from personal experience, like just GI effects, right? Like upset stomach, loss of appetite um, that are more acute onset. Exactly. And going back to you know, that you've got in your in your gut, you have the the natural flora, that that good bacteria that you need. And certainly when you if a person and your pet is on antibiotics long term, it the body that you know, that that antibiotic doesn't know the difference between good versus a bad bacteria. So you're going to end up getting rid of all the bacteria in the gut. And it can certainly lead to diarrhea, to stomach upset. So that that's definitely that's a, a great point to bring up. That seems something that you would when taken internally. So when you're using these with with enzymes, you you are not they they don't have those those side effects. But the 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 products that I'm speaking of are going to be used outside of the body. Right. Is, all topical. Be, yeah, yeah, all topical. That's correct. 
Yeah. So why don't you go into a, a kind of a compare contrast um, between sure. enzymes and antibiotics? Absolutely. I'd love to. And I'm just going to use the ear infection because that's what we're talking about today. In the case of an ear infection, a dog is presented with an ear infection. They have done the culture. They've done the cytology. They've determined what you know, it's a mixed infection. Veterinarian has picked the product to use. And I'll go back to my days as a veterinary technician doing tremendous amount of client educating go into the, the, the exam room to talk to the pet parent after the veterinarian is done. I've got the antibiotic uh, odic goes into the ear. There might possibly be systemic antibiotics and have to take you know by mouth. And with antibiotic therapy, I would have to explain to the pet parent, you're going to have to go home, take Q-tips or a cotton swab, dig down in that painful in, you know, inflamed, irritated ear, try to get as much gunk out as you can, and then you put the, the otic in there. And then you might possibly have to also give them pills, which can be a little bit uh, stressful too. With enzymatic therapy, you just treat because, and you can see the, the pet parent like, ah, it's like they, their face lights up because if it's hard for a pet parent to do, if they feel like they're hurting their pet, they're not going to do it. I can relate to that. Many, many people can relate to that. And they come back for a recheck in a few weeks and there really hasn't been any change. So with enzymatic therapy, the reason why you don't clean during treatment is because the way those enzymes are formulated, they need that exudate, that gunk, that pus to act as the catalyst for the enzymes. So you're just once a day squeezing it into an ear. And if they let you rub the ear canal, if, they, if it's too painful, it's okay because it works its way down. So that is a huge thing that people love is the, with enzymatic therapy, the not having to clean the ear every day because the pet is not going to let you do it anyway. So th there's the, that cleaning aspect of it. Having something that's just a once a day application. There are some antibiotics that are multiple times a day. And again, going back to pet parents want something that's going to be, to be easier and not something they're going to have to keep up with. So there's that, uh, just doing it once a day is much more convenient. The no side effects with enzymatic therapy, much less risk and especially for pets of all ages. With antibiotics, there, and I mean, this can occur with, with any product, but you can possibly have deafness can occur. You can have some of the, the, the antibiotic odics can have some harsh chemicals in them, alcohol, things that are gonna burn, that are gonna be very uncomfortable. With enzymatic therapy, it's, the enzymes are very, very gentle, even on the, the angriest of, of infected ears. Nothing that's gonna exacerbate an already very painful condition. So th that's a big thing because you, you don't want something that's going to, again, cause, cause further, further pain. So you're, that kind of ties in with creating a fear-free environment. I know, uh, I'm sure people can relate to this. You use something on your pet for an ear infection that is very painful to put in there. They know what that bottle looks like and you go to grab it the next time and they're trying to cram themselves under the couch or under your bed because they know what, what you're going to do. So that, that to, to have something that is not going to, to burn or that's, that's going to sting. Also, another advantage of broad spectrum antimicrobial enzymes is they will, will eradicate all harmful microbes. There are a lot of antibiotic odics that are, that are just for, for bacteria or just for, for fungus or yeast. With, with, and, and that's where it, the cytology and doing the, the culture to determine exactly which microbe it is, because they're, 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 I know I said most ear infections are going to be mixed, but there are those cases where sometimes it's going to just be yeast or it's going to be primarily bacteria. But with antimicrobial enzymes, you don't have to worry which microbe it is because it will eradicate bacteria, fungus, and yeast, and it will do all of those. You keep saying the harmful, it actually spares the good bacteria in the ear? It actually does. It actually does. The way that the enzymes are formulated, they are only going to target 
what we call single celled organisms, meaning that the healthy tissue. Again, there are odics, there are ear, ear treatments. Again, they, they will take care of bacteria, harmful bacteria, fungus, and yeast. But just like we talked about with antibiotics that you take orally, they don't know the difference between the good and bad. There are odics out there that will get rid of the harmful bacteria, fungus, and yeast, but they are very, they can be over drying. They can have a lot of alcohol or a lot of bleach, which will take care of those, those bad bugs, but you're looking at can also affect healthy tissue and over dry or even irritate it. And then that's just going to exacerbate. Many enzymes are specific for a particular pathogen. Therefore, it's, it's rare that they disturb the normal flora or that antimicrobial enzymes have bacterial resistance. In a nutshell, enzymes, they're natural, they're non-toxic and non-reactive, and they're never going to cause adverse side effects. The enzymes, they are naturally found in milk, and they are from milk proteins. Broad-spectrum antimicrobial enzymes, what's interesting about Pet King Brands, been around for 25 years, the owner, uh, Pam Bosco, who owns the company, her brother, Michael, actually is the brainchild behind the enzymes. He was very, very interested in the broad spectrum properties of milk proteins and had was interested that for centuries they had been used to kill bacteria, fungus, and yeast. So he is actually the one that isolated three specific enzymes, lactoperoxidase, lysozyme, and lactoferrin. And those are from milk proteins. And he found that those three together in conjunction made a very powerful antibacterial and antifungal to include yeast and also uh, anti-inflammatory. But he took it a step further. The pH is different in all species, dog to cat, which is why you have, there's a ton of products out there for dogs for ear infections. Not that many products that are safely used on cats. Uh, or that will work on CAS because the pH is different. With our products, the way that the enzymes are formulated, it doesn't matter what the species is. It, a dog, a cat, a, a, an exotic, a bunny, it doesn't matter what, a pet, all pets of, of all ages, uh, our products can be safely used on. The enzymes are very potent, broad spectrum, natural anti-inflammatory antibiotic alternative, basically is what it does. The powerful Enzymatic action is going to clean and disinfect while also destroying those harmful microbes. So it's it's a it do, it does more than just than just kill the, you know, the those microbes. It's also going going to you know, to to effectively clean and 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 disinfect the ear without ever over drying. You literally cannot overuse these products because there's nothing in in our products that's going to this is going to be toxic. It's going to be, be harsh. There's no harsh chemicals. There's no detergents. There's no dyes. The active ingredients are the LP3 enzymes. And that's what's going to kill those bad, bad bugs in the ear and maintain the neutral pH in the ear and not ever over dry and not ever harm surrounding healthy tissue. It's going to be very, very soothing, very, very quickly and effectively uh, taking care of, of any bad, bad ear infection. So Jennifer, I want to follow up on a couple things. First yeah, of all, please. people, you cannot simply pour milk from your refrigerator <laughs> no. in into your pet's ear. Uh, no, I'm, I'm we, sure there's yes. some pr proprietary technology there that uh, makes this effective, even though it does come from milk enzymes. Thing is, mm -hmm. I'm just not clear. Is it a, a liquid that is squirted in in the ear? Then okay. it's not an ointment. It's not a gel. It's not a cream. It's it's an actual liquid. Is that true? That that is true, and I'm glad. Yeah, you don't you don't want to pour milk in your in your animal's ear. These are derivatives of milk proteins. They're also just let me mention. No concern if you have a lactose intolerant dog. It's not gonna because they're not taking it internally. This is a, a a liquid. It is a it comes in a a bottle, a, a catheter tip, and you're actually squeezing it into into the ear once a day, and it works its way down into into the ear. And you're you're not having to again you dig that gunk out first. Just squeeze it into the ear once a day. The pet will shake its head. 
that gunk will work its way up to the top. You can take a uh, gauze pad or paper towel and wipe the excess, but you do not want to disturb what's down inside the ear. And it will, it goes through, you know, there's all the pharmacokinetics of it, uh, you know, depriving the, the bacterial cell of oxygen and starving of oxygen, which don't need to go into all that. Um, but it, it works very, very tough on those those harmful bugs, but very, very gentle on a very infected, painful ear. And very effect. it wor works very, very quickly. It's very easy to use. There's is no sting, you know, the, the, the no cleaning application. It's important for pet parents because it means less pain for the pet, increased client compliance, uh, fear-free environment, very soothing and calming. Well, Jennifer, I think the biggest thing, you told me when we, we spoke, prior to this podcast, that there's a 97% success rate. Yes, there is. Absolutely. That's, that is amazing. So the <laughs> bottom line is it works. So yes, absolutely. It works. It definitely works. And it is that so we have a huge following of you know, veterinarians and pet parents alike, that, but there are still so many people that don't know about our product. And when they do learn about our product, they can be a little bit a, a little bit uh, skeptical, a little hesitant, because it is, it's it's all natural. And I think some people equate all natural with it's not going to be as effective. The clinic I worked in, there was an, an old school veterinarian. He had the mindset of if it didn't smell horrible or sing like the Dickens, it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And it had to be an antibiotic. It had to have alcohol. It had to have all these harsh things. And that is that is certainly not the case. Well, it is so, so refreshing and wonderful to be able to be working for a company that has products that, yes, they are all natural, but they work so quickly and so effectively and pets of, of all ages, even on the worst of the worst of ear infections. It has been so rewarding to talk to a veterinarian or a, a, at a show who's never heard of our products and and they're a little skeptical and I give them a sample of the, the ear product and I say, use it on, pick one of your, your cases that you're working on where you're, you're, they keep coming back. They're, you're not getting any resolution. Oh. And they call me within just a week or sometimes less and say, I, I really, I really thought you had gotten me some snake oil. Mm -hmm. I am blown away. They are blown away. All you have to do is try it. It's, it, it's amazing. It is amazing. I was turned on to it by our uh, veterinary sales rep who swears by it. I'm glad she did. It works really effectively for Mac. Yes, certainly. And you know, I, I'm again, I, I don't ever want to say anything negative about antibiotics. We still have veterinarians right. that they will still use you know, antibiotics because not, not everything will work on every path. You know, so we, my biggest thing, because with, with enzymatic therapy, it takes a little bit of educating, a little more educating and, right. and, and just letting people know, veterinarians and pet owners know and groomers, whoever is it wants to know that there are there are options out there that, mm -hmm. that are effective and that are safe. I had a blind dog before I had Mac and I was prescribed a ear medication for my dog and he had a neurotoxic reaction to it and lost his hearing for three weeks. So it did come back, thankfully. But to navigate the blind dog now with the hearing loss was really distressing uh, for everyone involved. Um, I wish I had known about that then. Um, I'm glad I know about it now. And thankfully, he did get his hearing back, but it was it was terrifying. It was absolutely a terrifying experience. Certainly. And that that, like I had mentioned in the the side by side comparison, there are odics out there that can that can cause deafness in some some cases. It's temporary, but in some cases it's not. It's permanent. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're right. I don't want to I don't want to bash antibiotics. They certainly have their place. They absolutely have their place. But I like that we have we have an alternative. We have an alternative. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially when you're when you're talking about you know, elderly, when you're talking about cats that are, are sensitive, you, know, you can't give cat aspirin. Smallest things can be toxic. But also when, when you're elderly dogs and there are, you know, uh, people are concerned about using something that could be harmful. You, know, you, you certainly don't want to, the, the safety the, uh, mm -hmm. issue right. is definitely a concern. So to wrap things up. I guess the, the big things I'm hearing, one, it certainly seems like allergies are much more prevalent today and it's a serious problem and it affects the skin, but especially the ears. And it's a quality of life issue. It can be an emergency. It's something that needs to be addressed. And so consulting the veterinary team to find the right product for those ear 
diseases, the ear infections, knowing the frequency at which to administer and, you know, clean the ears and just, and be vigilant as a pet parent cannot be overstated. Jennifer, I just, don't you think, Kathy, we just learned so much yes. about ears and allergies and infections and treatments. Where can our listeners find you, find Zymox, the broad spectrum antimicrobial ear treatment? Is it over the counter? Have we addressed that? Uh, no, we have not. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. For many, many years, we went through veterinary distribution and it could be found at veterinary clinics. About eight years ago, we decided to go over to pet specialty because not everyone is in a position to take their dog to the veterinarian for an ear infection. And we wanted to make it more accessible to the consumer, to the pet parent. So it, it, it is available over the counter. Uh, you can also get it on online, Amazon, Chewy, uh, has our products. Uh, they're sit, you know, certainly you veterinary clinics as where most people get it, but yes, it is definitely available online. You can also get our product uh, direct through through our company as well. And we, we are trying to make it as not taking money out of the hands of veterinarians or trying to take business away from them. It's actually, when we went over to Pet Specialty, it actually, we saw a boost in veterinary sales because we raised awareness, brand awareness with the consumer and the pet parent. And that helped us because they would go into their veterinarian who was not carrying it. And they would say, I heard about Zymox and I used it. Please, will you please get this into your practice? And that, so it actually ended up helping us to spread the word, to raise uh, our, you know, again, brand awareness about, about our product and get the, the veterinarians on, on board to, to bring it in, into their practice. So if veterinarians or pet parents want to find you, how can they do that? They can go on online, www.zymox.com. That's Z-Y-M-O-X. They can certainly reach out to me. I'm more than happy to give you my, my email address. My email is jgreen. That's G-R-E-E-N-E -E -E, at Pet King Brands. That's P-E-T-K-I-N-G-B-R-A-N-D-S dot com. And I welcome anyone to reach out to me. I would love to uh, samples, to do more educating. I can do uh, lunch and learns for vet clinics, for for those people that that may have a, a again a brick or mortar, have a you know a retail shop or do any type of, of e-tail, just pet parents, anyone with any questions. It is just all about educating and just letting people know that there are safe options out there that, and again, I this entire conversation, I have had Riley's face in my mind, uh, that yeah. little golden, and I, I think about him and I, I don't ever want anyone to be in that that position again. And I know all too well, so I talk to veterinarians all the time that they have been using the same products for years. They are getting good results, but the infections are coming back. And going back to pet parents wanting something that is going to be easy to do and is not going to cause any, any pain. Is there something that can help? And if they can provide relief, something that's safe and effective, and they will tell other people. So I love, I love being a, being a part of that. Well, your passion certainly resonates loud and clear, and I think this is going to be very valuable education for our audience, and uh, we can't thank you enough, Jennifer, for spending your time with us and sharing your vast you, expertise when it comes to allergies and ears. Well, Liz, I, can, I, cannot, I cannot thank y'all enough for your time today. I feel like I could I could just talk about this, keep going on and on and on. There's, there's, and I hope that I was able to cover all the the important <clears throat> subjects and the and and get the word out there and was able to answer your questions. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, and provide information. And again, I welcome welcome people to to reach out to me because that I am I I say it all the time. Before I'm a sales rep, I'm a, a dog mom and a, a vet tech. And those providing relief, uh, no, being working on both sides of the counter, so to speak, as a technician and also in sales, knowing the struggles, I am all too familiar with it. So that, that's my passion. I love it. I really, really enjoy uh, talking to people about this and being a part of, of helping them 
and helping helping dogs to you. And, and cats, you know, to to live as as healthy lives as possible. Well, thank you thank very you, much Jennifer. for being here. Thank you so thank much. You. It was my pleasure. Thank you. You know, Chris, as we were talking about ear infections and uh, ear allergies, it made me think of our friends at Heads Up Pets Watercolor. Yeah. Because if your dog goes swimming, because that's part of the whole process, you could get water in your ear. The Heads Up Pets Watercolor is going to keep your dog's head and nose above the water. Yes. Even if they become unconscious, even if yes. they get into an accident and lose consciousness, that head and nose is going to stay above water. So I think that that there's a good chance that this product is going to minimize the amount of water that's going to get in a dog's ear. I couldn't agree more, 100%. I remember using a similar and less effective product when I had my business and we swam dogs for rehabilitation. Sometimes it wasn't that the dog's head was too low in the water or anything like that, but they would make a quick turn and they would dip that ear or right. the, the floppy ear dogs. It, it would right. it almost seem like a tickle and their ears would be in the on the surface of the water. And then they'd start shaking and shaking and shaking their head. And it was very, very distracting. And, you know, and certainly for those dogs that are getting water in their ear and then they're swimming sideways right. like this because they got <laughs> the, the water in their ear that they can't get out. Couldn't agree more, Kathy, that, that this would be not only a great product to save your pet's life, you know, and prevent drowning, but also to help them medically to prevent those ear infections, especially if you know your dog tends to get a flare up, you know, some type of irritation or infection following swimming. If your dog is a frequent swimmer, why not? Let's prevent it from happening altogether. So I encourage our listeners to go to headsuppets.com. Those are in our show notes. They can take you right there. They're one of our sponsors. If you're interested in ordering your dog a Heads Up Pets water collar, use the promo code PETPOD22, that's P-E-T-P-O-D-2-2, all capital letters when ordering your Heads Up Pets water collar. Great investment. Hey, Kathy, I think now may also be a good time to mention our new year survey that we're launching in 2023. So the purpose of the survey is that we want to understand you and your pets better to ensure that our content is relevant helpful, and interesting to you as our listeners. Please complete this survey no later than January 31st, 2023, and you'll be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card. So one winner will be selected at random and notified via email. The link will be in our show notes. It will also be on all of our social media channels. And uh, again, we can only get better with your help. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please visit EnableYourPet.com. Thank you, and please tune in next time.